Three different watches, three very different prices, but the same inspiration. Today, we compare these three Rolex inspired pieces. folks and welcome back to wonder of watches i know it's been a while since i uploaded but just being very busy so quick wrister today i am wearing this vintage omega it's got a nine carat gold case it's got that sub seconds hand at six o'clock and it dates to around 1960 this uses a manual wind omega caliber 268 and it's just a nice piece okay so today we're going to be comparing rolex homages across three very different price ranges Firstly, the Pagani GMT, which can be bought from AliExpress for around 50 to 80 euro and is, of course, a Rolex GMT homage. Now, thank you very much to my good friend Michael from the Dublin Watch Group for lending me this for this comparison. Now, secondly, moving into a very different price category, we've got the Steinhardt Ocean One, which, of course, is a subby homage, in more particular, a Hulk homage. Now this is the 39mm version and can be bought from the Steinhardt website for 590 euro. And finally, is this a homage? <clears throat> well, I guess it's a huge nod to the legendary 1958 Tudor 7924, which was of course inspired by the Rolex 7538. In fact, the predecessor to the 7924 was the 7922, which we know used the Rolex 6538 big crown cases and fitted them with Tudor dials and third party movements by Flurrier. In addition, the Archer type brace that used on that watch had riveted links and bore the Rolex signature. This of course is the very popular Tudor Black Bay 58, which comes into really the entry level of the luxury tier. It retails for about three and a half thousand on the bracelet, but I bought mine on the original Tudor NATO, which of course this is not, it's an aftermarket NATO by Archer Straps. Okay, so we're going to compare the three watches, different elements from the case to the dial to the loom. Then I'll wrap up and see if the price difference is warranted and maybe you can get an idea if you wanted to come in at a given price range or whether it was worth holding off for one of the more expensive pieces. Okay, beginning with the case then, the Pagani. It has a diameter of 41 mil. It's got a thickness of 13.3 mil. It has a lug width, as all the watches do here, of 20 mil, and it's got a lug to lug there of 47.4 mil. Now, the Steinhardt clues in the name here, folks. This is the Ocean 139, which means a diameter of 39 mil. We've got a thickness there of 12.7 mil, and it's got a lug to lug of just shy of the Pagani, 47 mil even. And moving on to the Tudor then. This again has a diameter of 39 mil. It's got a height of 12 mil even. And we've got a lug to lug on a par with the Pagani of 47.4 mil. Okay, so in terms of the case, as you move through each watch, it becomes more spelt and proportional. Now there are a number of reasons for this from what I can see. The first is the overall height of the watch. It gradually decreases from 13.3 mil on the Pagani to 12.7 mil on the Steinhardt and then an even 12 mil on the Tudor. Now, the bezel, case back and case profiles are all that little bit bigger on the Pagani. The lug guards have more presence than the Steinhardt and of course the Tudor has no lug guards. But taking just one element, say the case, excluding the bezel and the crystal and the case back, here on the Pagani, it measures 6.3 mil and there is little to no curve on the underside. So it doesn't hug the wrist quite as well as the Tudor or the Steinhardt. Now, taking the same measurement on the Steinhardt, that case without the bezel and the, the case back, it's a much more svelte 4.6 or 4.7 mil. And you can see the way there that it curves down to meet the wrist. The Tudor, it also includes that curve and the case back and bezel 
are much thinner than the other two it just makes for a much more a much overall proportional watch finally we get a focus there it just adds to the luxury feel now onto the crystal the time becomes much more legible as you move through the price tiers and i think the quality of the crystal is the main belligerent here all use sapphire crystal but when looking at the Pagani watch face, it just looks a little bit more milky and washed out than the other two. The Pagani and Steinharts, they also use Cyclops magnifiers, but the Pagani is going for two times magnification and actually I need to squint to see the date. It looks okay on camera there, but it makes me go a bit cross-eyed in real life. The Steinhardt opts for a more reasonable 1.5 magnification and the date is perfectly legible and the date font and writing itself is very well done and very very clear. It's a much better production than the Pagani. Now the Steinhardt again it uses a double AR coating on the underside of the crystal. This increases legibility and I have to say I enjoy the bluish hue that it emits from time to time. Now as we know Rolex and Tudor they, uh, they are allergic to AR crystals they don't use them at all. Now Tudor have used a vintage inspired top hat crystal on this watch. However, on the whole, I find the watch much more legible than the other two. And one of the main reasons for this, I think, is the distance between the crystal and the dial itself, or if you like, the thickness of the rehaut. Now, and onto the rehaut. So the rehaut used on the Pagani is so thick that it appears that the dial and hand sit well below the crystal, almost like you're looking into a barrel. The Steinhardt improves that drastically with a, a much thinner rehaut. But the pricier Tudor's tighter tolerances and attention to detail make it look like the dial is right on the surface, even given the box domed crystal. And the hands of the watch, in particular the seconds hand, looks like it's placed almost immediately below the underside of the crystal. Moving to the bezel, now the Pagani uses a ceramic bezel but the colors are just a little bit too loud for my liking. I prefer them to be a bit more subdued, but look, I'll be honest, I'm not a huge fan of Pepsi bezels anyway. It looks a bit more metallic to cer than ceramic to my eye, but I guess the specs don't lie. But the bezel, the, excuse me, the bezel indices are really well done and look perfect to my eye, even under macro. Dare I say it, the finishing is better here than the Steinhardt. Now, the bezel. It's very light and offers little to no resistance. It has quite a sloppy action there. And if I move back up to the 12 o'clock position, despite what side of it you go, it's quite badly misaligned there. Yeah, <laughs> okay. Now the Steinhardt also uses a ceramic bezel. The green used here is more subdued but really beautiful and really pops in the different lights. The way it interacts with the sunburst style when exposed to different light sources is really spectacular. Now alignment, it's not perfect, but the action offers plenty of resistance. And when set, there's very little slop and it's unlikely to move accidentally, unlike the Pagani there. Now the Tudor uses a vintage slimline and absolutely gorgeous coin edge bezel which adds little to the overall height of the watch. Now unlike the other watches this is a 60 click bezel. Can I get that to focus? Yes there we go. The action inspires confidence with a reassuring click and there is little to no slop at all there. The red triangle that vintage red triangle is perfectly aligned to the 12 o'clock position and it's almost like there's a deeper recess there. So it stays in that 12 o'clock position and doesn't move at all. And it's also aligned with the other minute indices as you rotate it there around 360 degrees. There is an absolute chiasm gap in quality here. The crown. Now, the crown uncrews, un, excuse me, it unscrews quite smoothly on the Pagani, but again, the action feels lighter and less substantial. Sometimes when I pull out into the time change position, it hasn't done it there, but it sometimes it leads to an involuntary jump 
of the hour and minute hand. Oh, it's not doing it at all. Maybe I'm completely wrong about that. Also, when in the time change position, there is plenty of movement there before the crown engages with the, you can see it there, before the crown engages with the, with the minute hand to change the time. However, when it comes to winding, it feels quite good and smooth. It's very easy to wind. It's got a nice action and the sound is good. Screwing back in, I can feel those. I can feel the threads realigning and it's great. It's very good. Now, the Steinhardt crown is absolutely butter, buttery smooth when unscrewing. Again, there's just that little slop before it engages with the minute hand. Oh, I'm in the wine position there now. Let me just come out. A little bit of slop there. But when I, it's the same on the Tudor. And I guess this is just maybe something I haven't noticed on watches before. But the winding feels very good. And anybody who's, who's, uh, who uses a 2A242 movement uh, would be familiar with the winding action here. Not quite as noisy as the Pagani, but very robust. Now, screwing this one in, it's hard to, oh, it happened very easy there, to align the threads, but screwing back in is, is a, it's quite stiff. But it's a solid movement, a 2A24, elaborated, which means it's uh, adjusted to three time positions, and it's an excellent movement. Okay, now, everything about the Tudor crown with that Tudor rose is buttery smooth from unscrewing to changing the time and winding the watch is barely audible you can't really hear it there and it just feels next level now when I'm screwing it back in Easy to get the treads to line up and it screws in beautifully. Again, the crown and crown action here is just on another level to the other watches. Now onto the dial. The dial on the Pagani is a basic matte black, but I'm really impressed with the application of the indices and the finishing of the hands. The applied indices themselves are more dense than the Steinhardt's. They are well finished in a high polish and the application of loom is smooth and even. The Mercedes hands are also very well finished and the loom looks even and the dial printing is fine here. When it comes to the Steinhardt under macro, the finishing on the hands and indices is marginally better but the real star of the show here is the sunburst green dial and check out my, my full review of the Steinhardt for some good shots of the dial. The dial printing is better here than on the Pagani. Now the Tudor takes it on to an absolutely other level when it comes to the dial. The dial itself is textured. The printing you can see under macro is actually raised up and at this level almost looks embroidered. The indices are slightly larger than on both the Pagani and the Seinhardt. They are also deeper and finished in rose gold to perfection. The deeper index allows them to be filled with more loom, the application of which is smooth as ice. Speaking of which, onto the loom shots. Now in terms of the loom, I think there is a clear winner here. The Pagani, as you would expect, is the first to fade. The Steinhardt with its BGW9 is holding on, in particular the luminous triangle on the bezel, but the Tudor keeps shining with its custard colored loom, which looks off-white under lice, but not enough so that it looks like the, the much maligned faux patina. Now in terms of the movements, the Pagani uses a pearl. Can I get that to focus? DG5833 GMT. It's a Chinese movement with 35 hours of power reserve. And of course, a GMT function. The GMT function now is not a jump hour like some expensive models. And in fairness, the movement there is very nicely decorated, even including that Ro excuse me, Rolex inspired uh, what would you call that? Like a mauve gear there. 
just at about 11 o'clock as we're looking. It's nicely decorated and visible through the see-through case back. Now the Steinhardt uses a tried and tested ETA 2824 movement. It's a workhouse Swiss movement with 38 hours of power reserve, uh, a reasonably high beat, 28,800 beats per hour. It's got shock protection. And as I said before, this is the elaborated version, which means it's adjusted to three positions for accuracy and nicely decorated and visible through the see-through case back. Now the tutor, not visible through the back, but it uses an in-house caliber MT5402 movement, which is regulated to COSC standards. It also has a 28,800 BPH reasonably high beat movement and offers 70 hour of power reserve. It has uh, 27 joules and it's just a fantastic movement. Although we'll see if it stands up to the test of time. Now onto the bracelet. I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on this because a little bit unfair to the tutor. I haven't got the bracelet for this one, but buying it on the NATO. But I have to say the clasp on the Pagani is very very good obviously it's inspired by Rolex as well and it uses a tension hold mechanism rather than you know the two button pushers so it's really well done it's a milled clasp and excellent for 50 to 80 euro it's an excellent clasp now the links themselves they just feel a little bit light uh, and not quite as robust as the bracelet on the Steinhardt, which is really excellent. It's a quality, it's a quality solid bracelet with solid end links. Of course, it's got female end links, which I love because it just adds to the overall. Um, uh, it sits on the wrists much better than if you've got this protruding middle link coming out of the end link here. It's really good. It's got screws to change, as does the Pagani, in fact. But the clasp, it looks like a stamped clasp in places. And maybe, not even quite, there is that part is milled, but this part looks stamped. Maybe it's not. It's got a nice uh, brushing on the inside. And a brushing on the outside, which helps with scratches. It's a reasonably good clasp, but I have to say I'm very impressed with the clasp on the Pagani. Now the tutor, look, I don't have the bracelet. It has the full rivets, which some people, you know, are not a big fan of, but I believe it's a very good bracelet. Um, I bought a, a Jubilee bracelet for this, but I just prefer the tutor on the NATO. Okay, so concluding thoughts then. Look, <laughs> I'm not a huge fan of, of the Pagani or watches like this. It, de it desperately tries to ape the Rolex GMT, but to me, it just feels cheap in too many areas, from the bezel to the bracelet the movement used and the overall bulkiness of the watch. In addition, the finishing on the case is quite rudimentary and the dial is very basic, though I have to say it is finished very well. So I guess for 50 to 80 euro, you can't really go wrong. It will give you the look of a Rolex, but it's definitely not a Rolex. And either is the Steinhardt for that matter. But it's not trying to be either. And yes, the dial, the dial layout is directly inspired by the Rolex Submariner. And of course, it's very much a hull homage, but there are you know, enough unique design cues here to make the Steinhardt its own thing. I think you can proudly wear this as a watch in its own right, safe in the knowledge that you are not trying to fool people into thinking you're wearing a Rolex Hulk. The dimensions are different to a Rolex. The case shape is a major departure, as are the crown guards and the shape of the hour hand for that matter. But this is a quality watch. The finishing is excellent and the dial and bezel here are really fantastic. It also uses a rock steady and well established Swiss movement. The Tudor, well I guess this could actually be described as a direct substitute for a Rolex. They are of course the sister company with the same founder Hans Wildorf, but where the Rolex are always evolving like the last of Mariner was an iterative one mil increase. Tudor are free to experiment and in the case of the BB58 they've gone backwards looking towards their heritage but I think this could be the greatest watch on the market at the, at the moment. <laughs> I'm probably biased there. It's Rolex links, the in-house movement, the beautiful dial finishing that glorious unguarded crown. 
and a reflection of some of the most iconic watches ever made. In comparison with both the Steinhardt and the Pagani, the Tudor trumps it on so many levels, from the loom to the crown action, the 70 hour COSC certified in-house movement, the finishing, the heritage, and just the overall svelte feel of the watch. I guess at the end of the day, you get what you pay for. Good luck everybody, Ben. <laughs>